Welcome into the Cleveland Browns report. We've got to pull up our bootstraps and try and put on our game face because there is still a long season ahead. And yes, Nick Chubb is gone for the rest of the year. Yes, last night was probably one of the most depressing Browns games I've ever seen because of how easy it was for them to win if they did not turn it over four times and still keep themselves within one score despite all that. But a lot to assess. We need to have... I think just basically a heart to heart, like an emergency meeting, a huddle up session here, and we need to rally around one another because morale's low. Let's just call it what it is. Morale is low. I don't know what it's like to be in the Browns locker room right now, but you just lost the engine for your team, right? You lost the heart and soul of this team in a lot of ways. So Nick Chubb gone for the rest of the season. Our worst fears have come to life. And I don't know if anyone else felt this way, but I woke up this morning and I just kind of hoped Last night was just a horrible dream and nightmare, and none of that happened, but it did happen. And unfortunately for the Browns, this happens to one to two teams every single year, right? Right now, it's the Browns and the Jets having their hearts ripped out from their chest right off the bat. But we've got a long season to go, so we got to keep the train moving. I, I don't know how else to say it, but I do want to show Nick Chubb endless amounts of support and love right now because the guy's been the most consistent piece and figure of this team. For a half decade at this point, he has been the rock. He has been the heart and soul of the Cleveland Browns franchise since he got drafted in so many ways. So let's show the guy some love. If you have never chatted before in the live chat, I think this is probably the first great opportunity to uh, pop your chat cherry and get in there and start typing 24. Because I want Nick Chubb to feel the endless amount of love and support from the dog pound. I don't know if he'll ever come across this, but if, so if he ever does, I just want him to see an endless number of 24s in the chat. So I'm going to give shout outs. Matthew, I saw your super chat. We'll throw that on screen in a few minutes. Don't worry. Gregory, cool guy called Zone. Christopher, Captain Nog, ECOHD, Noah Wilson, Chauncey, Joshua Miller, Noah, Icy Prods. Shout out to everyone tuning in right now. It is a tough day to wake up and go, I want to listen and hear about things that are going to hurt me. And right now, talking about Nick Chubb is a very, very sad subject. But the reality is, the NFL stops for no one, right? It, it, the season continues. Uh, th there's no undo button. There's no packing it up and going home. There is still a lot of football to be played this year. A lot of football. So we're going to have to do our best to soldier on through and play the rest of the year out for Nick Chubb. I mean, that's what the team's doing. That's what the locker room's doing. They have dedicated every game, every practice, every snap to Nick Chubb already. So the best we can do as fans and media and just dog pound members is do the same and carry that kind of love and torch for Nick Chubb moving forward as I know it sounds like I'm giving a bit of a eulogy, but damn it, Trace, kind of feels like it, right? Y you didn't just lose a good player. Y you lost a guy that has been... Such a, a statue-worthy type player. Yeah. Well, and on top of that, not to mention he's a statue-worthy worth, player, but he's also a player that brings a lot of juice, a lot of energy, leadership in the yep. locker room. He's not just on the field impactful. He's also impactful off the field as well. So it's, it's just tough to see that injury, too. It's such a, a stand-up guy like Nick Chubb. Indeed, indeed. So keep getting those 24s in the chat. We have some other uh, kind of just uh, – Questions and whatnot we'll get to. But I do want to hit the super chat that came in before we started streaming. Shout out to Matthew Krupa uh, for super chatting before we even got this plane off the ground. Excuse me. Matthew says, us Browns Nation needs to come together and show support for Chubb and donate to his charity at First Candle Prayers for 24. Matthew, this is an incredible super chat, a very kind gesture, and an awesome promotion of Nick Chubb's charity. So if anyone is feeling so inclined and they want to go support him in more ways than just one, there's the charity at First Candle. Um, um, yeah, sure. Uh, but Matthew, thank you very much for this very kind super chat. Really appreciate it. I'm sure Chubb does as well. Joshua, next one up. PD must have had a hot date to start the show early. We are starting early today. The reason being is I couldn't wait until 5 o'clock Eastern. To talk to you guys. Are you kidding me? I mean, this is an emergency meeting right now we're having here. This is a family meeting, right? You just lost a member of your family. It's the circle of trust. We got to get here. together as soon as possible. So believe me, I got everything together as quickly as possible this morning. 
to get this show off the ground as soon as possible because I was going to sit at my desk for an extra few hours waiting until 4 Central, 5 Eastern. Absolutely not. Josh, I, uh, I would say I appreciate that, but my girlfriend would definitely not appreciate that if she saw this. So uh, she's the hot date tonight. How about that? We'll see her at Trivia. All right. Pick a running back for me, Kareem Hunt or Leonard Fournette. I have seen this all over the Twitter streets. Even in Kevin Stefanski's Zoom press conference this morning, Kareem Hunt came, came up. Kevin Stefanski, you know, dodged the question, so to speak. He didn't want to get into specifics, but there's a clear connection, right? Try and bring back a guy like Hunt who has familiarity with the system, with the team, with the locker room, and knows what the Browns are trying to do offensively. Or do you go with Leonard Fournette, a guy who's, you know, a Super Bowl winning, winning running back. And he's got a lot of great seasons, but he's also got some not so good seasons. And both players still on the free agent market right now. If you had to pick one of these two players, which one would it be? I'm going to give you my selection later on in the show. But I do want to know from everyone watching right now what your, what your pick would be. Kareem Hunt or Leonard Fournette. Cool guy is going with neither. I get that too. There's a reason why both of these players are unsigned and we are into the season now. So, what's up? I like Joshua uh, Joshua Miller. He yeah. throws out an interesting idea to Dearness Johnson. Right, Dearness Johnson currently in Jacksonville as the RB3. That is definitely an option. Um, I don't know if Dearness Johnson's on their practice squad, which if he is, the Browns could just claim him off their practice squad and add him right to their active roster. You can't go from practice squad to practice squad, though. So if you do add a player from their practice squad, they have to go right to your active roster, which uh, as soon as the Browns make the procedural move of moving Nick Chubb to IR, that will open up a roster spot. So Dearness Johnson is an option for sure. All I'm going to say is he had three great games, and no, no doubt about that, in 2021. I think there's a reason why he never really got much going in Jacksonville after the Jags signed him and thought, hey, this could be a pretty good complimentary back to Travis Etienne. So I'm not quite in love with Dearness Johnson as much as other people are just because there were just three games in 2021 that were awesome three games. I don't know if we're going to find those three games for the rest of the season. So I, I would just pump the brakes a little bit on like, well, Dearness Johnson did it in three games in 2021. Why can't he do it again for the rest of the season? It might have been a uh, lightning in a bottle kind of uh, uh, moment there for Dearness Johnson. Uh, Kareem Hunt coming in from Manny. I've got David saying Leonard Fournette. Uh, I've got Sky saying Kareem Hunt. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, Jonathan Taylor later on. Don't worry. I've got Cool Guy saying Dearness, or, uh, yeah, Dearness Johnson for DJ. Christopher says Kareem Hunt out of the two of them. Michael says it's one of the dirtiest plays in NFL history. I hate Mika Fitzpatrick. You hate Minka Fitzpatrick. We all hate Minka Fitzpatrick. He went low, didn't have to go at the guy's knees. It was a, you know, uh, a chop block if it was on the offense, no doubt about it. It's a dirty play. It, it is a dirty play by Minka Fitzpatrick. I don't know if you try to settle some old score between all the matchups the Browns and the Steelers have had or what was going on there, but if he feels sick to his stomach, good. He should. He just took out one of the most beloved players' knees and possibly... I don't want to say career, but Nick Chubb isn't a second-year guy. You know, he's up there in the age column. He's approaching 30. Same knee injury he had in college, or the same knee he had in college, which was a very, very uh, severe knee, in knee injury while a Georgia Bulldog at Tennessee. So this is not a light ACL recovery or anything like that. It's going to be a massive Massive rehab and comeback if he's able to make one. Captain Nog, next one up with a $10 super chat. I appreciate you, Captain Nog. Man, Nick Chubb was the reason I became a Browns fan. He made football fun. Just the drive that man he has is magnetizing. It made me excited to watch football. I pray for a perfect recovery. Love you, Chubb. Yeah, Nick Chubb is awesome, and it sucks. And that's really all it comes down to. Nick Chubb is an awesome human being. He's an incredible football player. He is an awesome talent to watch. He's an absolute athletic freak that squats a 1,000 pounds whenever he wants to. And not having Nick Chubb out there is not going to feel right. It's going to feel weird. He has been such a pillar of this team since the moment he got drafted. It's the, only, the only crime is that he didn't start week one of his rookie season. What a mistake that was. 
but what do you expect? So, Nick Chubb, yeah, Captain Og, I echo a lot of these sentiments. Fucking sucks. Now, Nick Chubb is not the only storyline after this Monday Night Football defeat in Pittsburgh. We have to talk about Deshaun Watson, and there's just so much out there right now, it's hard to figure out. It's almost like we have a two-front war, right? You have the Nick Chubb, you have the entire Nick Chubb saga of trying to replace Nick Chubb, which you can't replace Nick Chubb, but you're going to make an effort to try and get some similar production out of a free agent, Jerome Ford, or someone in a trade. So that's op- that, that's the first front you're fighting. And then the, uh, the eastern front is Deshaun Watson. Do we have a problem? Because it seems like Deshaun Watson is not making the steps that we all thought he would go. Well, a lot of us thought, I shouldn't say all, uh, a lot of us thought he was going to make going into his second year with the Browns. I'm not quite as fiery or like, um, I, I don't know what the word, I, I'm not quite as given up. That's not really proper English. But I, I still have hope and faith and belief that Watson can turn this thing around. Because you look at last night's game, first off, why is the first play going to Harrison Bryant? Like that was, that, that's a red flag. You script your first 10 plays out. You practice them all week in practice. Who thought it was a good idea of first game in Pittsburgh this year, Monday Night Football, you know what we need to do, Trace? we got to get the ball to our tight end three. That's, that just didn't seem like a very bright idea, right? If you wanted to go to Amari Cooper and Cooper was her, just give it to Nick Chubb, right? There's nothing ever wrong with giving it to Nick Chubb on the first play of the game. So going to Harrison Bryant for the first play was not a very bright idea to begin with. Then Harrison Bryant doesn't make a catch. Deshaun Watson, not a perfect throw, but very catchable ball in my eyes. And then you have Jed Wills, who is the worst left tackle to look at when he gets beat. The man shows no effort. The moment he gets beat, he's just a pedestrian. He is like us. He is a spectator on the field. He is watching this entire play unravel in front of his eyes, and he can't move a toe. He can't try and make an effort to recover the ball or tackle TJ Watt. No. He's just going to stand there like all shoulders. Sorry, guys. My bad. So between the two, you know, defensive scores for Pittsburgh, I'm not going to put those all on Deshaun Watson. The throw, maybe 25 Watson, 75 Bryant. The strip sack, I mean, it was a half a second, right? Alex Highsmith came around the edge completely untouched it wasn't a miscue it wasn't a bad blocking assignment it wasn't that Watson didn't pick up the hot read or didn't throw quickly no Jed Wills completely dropped the ball he fumbled it himself so with that I do want to know what is your concern level over Deshaun Watson scale at 1 to 10 cool guys at a 9.1 Michael's at a 7 um, Sean's at a 24, Paul's at a 24, Anthony's at a 10, David's at a 10, Michael's at an 8, and yeah, I, I, I feel you guys. Christopher's at a 10, Terry's at a 9. For me, concern level of like this going horribly downhill, I would put myself at 7, right? I, I think a 7 is fair. Watson and the offense ran into, let's give credit, a really good Steelers defense. I, I like The Pittsburgh defense came to play. They were embarrassed last week, and you know Mike Tomlin's crew is not going to get embarrassed, embarrassed in back-to-back weeks. So they had a good week of practice. They got themselves ready. So give credit to T.J. Watt and the rest of the Steelers defense. They brought their A-plus game. They gave the Browns offense everything they could handle, and four turnovers was just one too many for Cleveland. Trace? So, so I want to add something here, too. The Deshaun Watson concern level, sure, it could be high for week two. You know, it's a very small sample size. Yeah. But what has been really good for the Browns is their defense. And if you look at a team set like the Saints where they've had, I mean, Derek Carr hasn't been great. Week one, he was decent. Week two, he wasn't that great. Mm-hmm. They have a great defense, and that's been carrying the team. So. It's not like just because Deshaun Watson's struggling early, that doesn't mean they can't still win games. No, I, I completely saying? agree. I so, mean, defense, like you said, is incredible so far. So Trace raises a good point. The Cincinnati Bengals last year started off 0-2. Joe Burrow looked lost. They went on to go to the AFC Championship game. Like, it's, it's two games. 
it's a long season. And this is honestly what separates probably more than anything fans from people in the building. And the people in the building know if you guys are going to panic after two games, good luck. Like, your heart can't take that. Because in the building, we know it's a long season. And the Browns are one and one. Like, take the Nick Chubb injury out of it. If I told you back in June, the Browns will start the year one and one, going up against Cincinnati and Pittsburgh. Are you really upset about that start? Like, sure, 2-0 and is ideal, and that's awesome. But to be 1-1 one and one and act like it's over, pack it up, that is an all-time overreaction. There is a lot of football left. There are a lot of games to be played. Players get hot. Players pick things up. Guys get off to slow starts. They turn things around. Sure, we expected more from Watson earlier on because of an extra week at training camp, playing in the Hall of Fame game, you know, all the buzz and the hype this offseason, and we're not seeing returns on our investment yet, which is a $230 million quarterback. But make no mistake, it's just week two. I think it's too early to really be serious about this team is doomed because Watson through the first two weeks has not looked superb. Watson the first game was good, right? I mean, he played in the same weather as Joe Burrow, and he out him 24-3. to In this go-around... Give credit to the Steelers' defense and the Browns' offense not being on their A game, but they still put up 22 points. Like, I've seen way worse performances on offense from the Cleveland Browns. I, I'm not going to start sinking the boat because of a one and one start to the year and Watson just not being where we want him to be. It's a long season. Jarrett Roush with a $20 super chat. Jarrett, salute to you, my man. Still can't wrap my head, my mind around it. Been wanting to talk to someone all day about it. I love this team and will always, always will, but this is just devastating. Only thing is to keep chugging along and try their damn best. Thank you, Pete. Jarrett, I couldn't agree more. I mean, it was an absolute hell of a morning today. I think we all experienced waking up going, like hitting your alarm and going, oh no, it happened. Like Nick Chubb, he's actually gone. He's, he's, out, he's out for the year. Watson, Got embarrassed. The Steelers still are, you know, the big brother in this rivalry. The Browns can't quite ever seem to be able to get off the ground. 1-0 start, great. Just couldn't quite get over the hurdle of being 2-0 for the first time in 30 years. That's so pathetic. 30 years can't be 2-0. And it couldn't have come against your Pittsburgh Steelers, the biggest rival, a lot of upsetting things, Jarrett, no doubt about it. And that's not even including Nick Chubb, but it's a long season. We got to soldier on, we got to keep chugging, and we got to have faith in this team, in this locker room, that they are not going to pack it up and go, well, that's it, that's the year. We'll see you guys in 2024. There is no, no, it's all in this season. So there's the boats are burned. There's no going back. We're here. Shout out your city for me before we really get into the weeds of this show. Let me know where you are watching from. I always love getting the audience involved. I think it's what makes the Cleveland Browns Report such a unique live show. I know there's a lot of great spots to get Browns content, but you know that I always want to hear from the audience. I want to get your takes and your opinions on screen. I want to get you guys heard. I want to have a two-way conversation. So shout out your city for me. Jarrett's in Decatur, Indiana. I've got Gregory in Salem, Ohio. Uh, Josh is picking up the kids. Yeah, 250 on the East Coast, so... I bet school's uh, pretty much wrapping up now. Matthew's in Greenville, South Carolina. I've got Carlos in Springfield. Levi's at work and mentor. Uh, I've got Captain Nog in Peoria. I've got Winnipeg, Manitoba in the house. Glendale, Arizona. Spencer's in the heart of Cleveland. Brent's in Vegas. Terry's in Bowling Green. Patrick is in Youngstown. Antonio's in Cleveland. Cody's from Seattle. Coach Jay's in Twinsburg, Ohio. My Ooh, Miami Mac is in L.A., on the West Coast today? Did I miss something? Chris is in Massachusetts. I've got Nashville, Tennessee, Tampa, Florida, LaGrange, Ohio. Joshua Miller saying 2-2 two and two going to the bye looks really good right now. Two big games coming up. We'll talk about that. The Titans and the Ravens at home. Maryland, Texas, Canton, Columbus. Max always been an I, – I'm a bad host. I do not know some of the OGs. I'm just from Miami. All right. That's a, that's a strike on me, Mac. That's my bad. Uh, Akron, and then Ty Man the Buckeye, as always, representing the Buckeye State in Ohio. 
Yeah, uh, Virginia Beach. Okay, Tampa, Florida. Let's uh, let's get into a trace. Let's jump into what we have is a three segment live show, and the last segment is a mailbag. So if you have any questions after last night, this is your opportunity to grab. Oh, I've lost my voice from the watch party. Grab the mic and take the floor. Hashtag Browns, or you can super chat if you want to guarantee a spot on screen and you don't want to be at the mercy of producer Trace to pick his favorite question. Super chat, we guarantee your spot on screen. We're going to run through a, re a recap and a debrief of last night, and then we're going to get into the very tough subject, and that is Nick Chubb replacements. Okay, are we all ready? Here we go. Let's do our best, everyone. Let's try and pull ourselves together. Let's talk about this game. I'm going to call an emergency meeting right now, and I've only got two, say, two words to say. This sucks. Losing Nick Chubb for the rest of the season is the ultimate gut punch. I mean, there are very few players that mean so much to their team like Nick Chubb does to the Browns. So to lose him to a really bad knee injury – on what I think was a bit of a dirty play from Minka Fitzpatrick, it sucks. This sucks. There's nothing else that really needs to be said. This sums it up, but the reality is the season's not stopping, right? We're two games in. We're still in September. There is a lot of football to be played, and the season stops for no one. So we got to pull up our bootstraps, and we got to put our big boy pants on, and we've got to rally around Nick Chubb and make him – the focal point of this season and play, you know, every snap, every down, every drive, every practice rep for Nick Chubb. I don't know that's what Greg Newsom said, and I completely agree and echo those sentiments. So with that being said, show some love, Nick Chubb. Show him, show, show him some love. Type 24 down in the comment section. Let's send some love over to Nick Chubb to start today's Browns report. Welcome into the Cleveland Browns report. Matthew Peterson here with some quick injury news before we start talking about Watson, Chubb, and everything else on today's live show, which was filmed, by the way, on Tuesday afternoon. Denzel Ward, who left the game in the fourth quarter with just cramps, is fine. He's not on the injury report. Uh, Kevin Stefanski did not hint at any injury revolving around 21. Greg Newsom is day-to-day -day with an elbow injury. He said after the game that he was okay, but... For now, day-to-day, -day, so that will be something to monitor throughout the week, and definitely a loss. I mean, Jim Schwartz said he's one of the best nickel corners in the NFL. And then Zarius Smith, who briefly left the game with an ankle injury, it appeared on Monday night. He returned to the game. He should be good to go. So outside of Nick Chubb, and that's the big elephant in the room, the rest of the injuries the Browns, Browns sustained during the game do not appear to be very serious or long-term. Now let's get into some overreactions. And I don't know how much of these are dramatic overreactions or fair overreactions to have, but we've got to talk about it. So let's start things off with Deshaun Watson. Is it time to panic? I'm going to give this to Bernie Heads. I'm not at one, and I'm not at four. I'm in the middle. On one hand, Deshaun Watson, through two games so far, I think we can agree, has not been uberly impressive, right? He hasn't looked like the guy that he was in Houston. He still led them to a win in week one, 154 yards, a touchdown. But we hadn't quite come out of that game with everyone in agreement that Watson was back to his old self. I think we can all agree on that front. And then week two against the Steelers, it was tough. It was tough sledding. I think a lot of credit has to be given to the Pittsburgh defense. They made life very tough on Deshaun Watson. 235 passing yards, a touchdown, an interception, fumbles all over the place, which... I'll say this right now, uh, Harrison Bryant and Jed Wills, they did no favors to Deshaun Watson. They helped a lot of people drive, I mean, narratives of this has been a disaster for the Browns so far. I'm here to say it's two games. It is two games. The Browns are one and one. Like, if you remove the Nick Chubb injury from the overall feeling and pulse of this team after the first two weeks of the season, Cleveland is one and one. I am not going to start burning down the boats and say, this has been an epic disaster. Watson sucks, and he's going to suck. He won 24-3 to in week one. He played 
below average against the Steelers. I think we can agree on that much. Had some good plays, had some nice sideline throws to Amari Cooper and Elijah Moore. Did some nice things with his legs. But at the end of the day, excuse me, I lost my voice in the watch party. Harrison Bryant as a tight end three as your first target on the first game, first play of the game, probably not a good idea. Jed Wills, I hate him. I mean, that's that's an overreaction, but damn it, he is the worst, worst left tackle when it comes to getting beat by an edge rusher and having no sense of urgency or just effort, it appears, to try and recover and help out on the play. The moment Watson lost the ball, you just see Jed Will stand there going, oh, oopsies, so sorry about that one. But simply put, Watson, he doesn't look like the Houston Texan Deshaun Watson, right? The guy who led the NFL in passing, we haven't seen that guy yet. It's only two games, so I'm not going to say that we can't get to that guy. There's a lot of stuff that has to get done. There's a lot of improvements that have to be made. But I'm not going to say after two games, the Browns are cooked. Deshaun Watson's toast. This has been an epic disaster on all fronts. It's been two weeks. Let's settle down for a minute. The offensive line in week two, by the way, it was probably one of their worst performances as a unit. I mean, excluding Dewan Jones, I'm talking just like your core offensive lineman for, you know, two years now, some of them going on for much longer. Jed Will sucked. Joel Petonio just, you know, the, the interior offensive line out of Ethan, outside of Ethan Posick's two holding calls, they played a pretty good game, all things considered. Dewan Jones is PFF grade 50.5. That's really being anchored down due to his run blocking grade. Pass blocking grade, he was in the high 60s. So I think going up against TJ Watt, which is a very tough test for your first start, Dewan, shown, Dewan Jones showed a lot to be excited about. I would say a lot of good tape and a lot of good snaps for a very difficult first assignment. But there are still improvements to be made, of course. However, I don't think Dewan Jones is going to be a liability or going to cost this team games or anything like that. I'm not going to panic two games in. If you are looking for me to start giving hot takes of the season's over, the Browns are screwed, no. That's not going to happen after two weeks. Every single NFL fan base, every single NFL fan base does this. The Cincinnati Bengals started off 0-2 last year, and they went to the AFC Championship game. There are always teams, there are always teams that get off to a bit of a slow start. It's a little bit clunky moving on, and then they figure it out because it's a long season. I'm not going to panic after two games. I'm just not. So what is your concern level over Deshaun Watson? Scale it 1 to 10. For me, I'd actually put myself at like a 6.5, right? I'd be lying if I wasn't a little bit concerned or even more than just 50% concerned because the play so far hasn't looked like a big jump now that he has eight starts as a Cleveland Brown under his belt, still waiting on what we saw in Houston for so many years. But two games into the year, no, I'm not going to start smacking the panic button and say the season's over. Sorry. Moving on to the next overreaction. Is the season over? Uh, fake news. It's not over. Like, realistically and metaphorically. Realistically, the Browns have played two games. They have 15 more games to play. There's a lot of football left. And then metaphorically, yes, losing Nick Chubb takes the wind out of your sails, and it sucks. It blows chunks but the Browns are one and one so as Aaron Rodgers once said R-E-L-A-X relax guys the Browns are one and one right now they've got three straight home games coming up with a bye week in there to try and regroup which at the beginning of the year I hated having an early bye but right now that bye week feels like I can't get here soon enough there's a lot of football left I am not going to punt on this year because of the Nick Chubb injury this is a very talented roster they're going to have to find a way to rally around Nick Chubb and move on without him. But the reality is the season goes on, and this is still a darn good football team. And if this defense just wants to play every single snap, they could probably keep themselves in every single game. This defense, I mean, the defense, for example, limited the Steelers to 12 points last night. They limited the Bengals to three points. If the defense stays at this level, the offense needs to just marginally improve, just marginally, and they're going to win. 10 games, right? Before we get to the rest of my opinions and whatnot after week two, today's Browns report is sponsored by AG1. I have AG1 literally every day. Get comprehensive and convenient daily nutrition at drinkag1.com slash chatsports. I recently gave AG1 a try because I hated taking pills slash vitamins. 
and wanted a supplement that actually tastes great. I take AG1 in the morning, and it makes me feel ready to take on my day. It really helps me with starting my day on the right foot and getting into a healthier lifestyle. I start the day with making one great choice, AG1, and more healthy decisions then follow. Covering my nutritional basis for the day literally couldn't be easier, which is why I trust AG1. I just mix one small scoop of AG1 with water, drink it first thing in the morning, done. I also like that it costs less than $3 a day, which is pretty good if you ask me. It's a really effective daily habit with the highest quality sourced ingredients, so win-win. If a comprehensive solution is what you need from your supplement routine, then AG1 is giving you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash chat sports. That's drinkag1.com slash chat sports. Check it out. The link is in the comments and the description of today's video. As I was saying, this team is one and one, and they've got some big games coming up on their schedule, right? Week three at home against the Titans. This is, as I put on my Twitter the other day, or just yesterday, um, the trap game for every single team playing Tennessee this year, where you think, oh, the Titans are washed up, they're done. Oh, no. Mike Vrabel is one of the best coaches in the NFL, in my opinion. He's going to have his boys playing hard, playing physical, and never going to be an easy out. This game scares me, kind of like the Falcons game did last year, which I don't want to say I told you so, but I told you so. Week four, the Ravens at home. I mean, if you can come out of this stretch here, just two and two, a one and one, and go into the bye two and two, I think going into the year, we'd all would be pretty okay if Cleveland came out of the first four games two and two. Then you get that much needed buy, and then you're home still against the 49ers, which is definitely going to be tough. But having them at, at home after a buy gives you the best opportunity to try and win. And then week seven, you go on the road to Indianapolis before going to Seattle. Listen, the reality is Nick Chubb, he's not coming through that door. He's not coming back the rest of the year, which means Deshaun Watson, you're the $230 million QB. It is time to lean on Watson. And that might not make a lot of sense right now after what we've seen the last two weeks, but that's the best option. That, that is truly the best option the Browns have is hope that Watson and this offense and Kevin Stefanski figure it out. Because you're not leaning on Jerome Ford, right? You're not leaning on David and Joku. No, you're leaning on Deshaun Watson. It's a long season that stops for no one. I don't know how else to put it. This is a bit of a, you know, tough love conversation that we all need to hear at this moment. But the reality is, Nick Chubb ain't coming back. Watson, you got to show us what we saw in Houston, right? You got to be that NFL passing leader. You've got to put on... One hell of a run here in honor of Nick Chubb, who is gone for the rest of the year. Like, no other way to put it. That, that is the best summary I can really get. We don't need to look at any numbers. We don't need to look at any stats. This is simply put, losing a huge piece of that locker room is irre irreplaceable. So now it's on to Sean Watson to try and at least fill that void to the best of his ability. It won't be completely filled, but you got to give it a good shot. Moving on to the third overreaction. Is this defense legit? Yeah, this is not an overreaction. Four Bernie heads. This defense is legit. Like I was saying, if the defense keeps playing at the level it's at right now, as long as the offense doesn't spot the other team 14 points, you're going to win football games. You're just it, It's just that simple. The Browns could have spotted the Steelers seven points, and they still would have won. I mean, really think about that. Like the Browns, after the first play of the game, 7-0 Pittsburgh, go, all right, now you guys got your free seven points. Let's start playing. And they would have won if they did not give them another seven points on the scoop and score. So the defense, I mean, look at what they did to the Pittsburgh Steelers offense, which, by the way, Steelers fans leaving Monday night's game, sure, they're going to be happy. They got the win. Every win feels, you know, monumental in the NFL. But I would not be confident if I was a Steelers fan. Kenny Pickett sucks. That offense sucks. Najee Harris sucks. That offensive line sucks. The Steelers are not going in a great direction. Credit to them. They did what they had to do. Their defense pulled up and made big plays and helped them get a win. And every win counts. But I am not going to be confident as a, if I was a Steelers fan moving forward. Like, no way. Browns defense so far this year, we're averaging over a touchdown a game. Incredible. It's just two games, so very small sample size, but less than 200 yards allowed. You know that 
horrible rushing defense last year. Well, this year, Shelby Harris, Maurice Turris, and Dalvin Tomlinson have quickly fixed that. 65 rushing yards allowed so far through two games. Two takeaways. And maybe the most impressive stat, they've only given up nine first downs. Really think about that for a moment. Just nine. I mean, this is like uh, Principal Peterson from uh, Sergeant George Peterson, the principal from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Nine times. Just nine times. There's been a first down picked up on Cleveland's watch through eight quarters so far. This defense is legit. And a big reason why is Grant Delpit is playing out of his freaking mind right now. Miles Garrett is always going to be Miles Garrett. I don't know who needs to hear this. If anyone does, Miles Garrett was not bad last night. Miles Garrett was drawing so much attention. You saw the rest of this defense get after Kenny Pickett. He was pressuring Pickett. He was forcing throwaways. But Grant Delpit, I mean, the guy had six tackles, led the team last night against Pittsburgh, had a clutch interception to really neutralize and kill the Steelers' momentum rush right off the bat. And he was Kenny Pickett's daddy. I mean, Kenny Pickett last night, 50, or I'm on Monday night, I should say, 15 for 30, 222 yards, one touchdown, one interception. Remove that completely blown assignment on George Pickens for nearly an 80-yard touchdown. We're talking about 14 for 29, 150 yards-ish, and one interception. The Browns' defense, I'm telling you, excuse, excuse me, the Browns in general, I, tru- I still believe this. They are going to finish above the Pittsburgh Steelers. The Steelers, Browns, one and one right now. But come November, come December, come January, at the end of the year, I'm much more confident in the direction the Browns are heading with this elite defense and an offense I believe can still improve and just be a little bit better than they currently are to get some wins. Whereas Matt Canada and Kenny Pickett, they have looked awful so far. I mean, they scored seven points in week one at home, and they scored 12 points in week two at home, and they never got inside the Browns' 30-yard line yesterday. Two straight home games, and their offense is in a much worse spot than the Browns' offense is. My final thoughts, it hurts right now. This hurts. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. It hurts. It sucks. I think just saying this sucks is the greatest line and something all sports fans can understand across the board because it just makes so much sense and all it requires is two words this sucks but we got a lot of football left and i believe in this team jared roush what's going on dude i know you said you don't want to change your predictions for the year but has this last game uh, disrupted your previous calls jared you know what's a bit interesting is when the schedule first came out I had the Browns winning week one and losing week two. Now, of course, once week two got closer and closer, I just wanted to have good vibes. I wasn't going to pick the Steelers. But losing Nick Chubb, yeah, very well could cost you a game or two, right? That that could make you from a ceiling of a 12-win team to a 10-win team, from an 11-win team to a 9-win team. So does it change my predictions moving forward? Absolutely. I'd be lying if I say it didn't. However, if the Browns make some moves and they get a good running back, that could try and offset some of those uh, production losses from Nick Chubb. But you're not replacing Nick Chubb on the sideline or in the locker room. That's that's impossible. Chef Rubin with a $2 super chat. Is Stefanski's seat warm or hot? The only only opinion that matters, or the only person opinions that matters, is Jimmy Haslam. I think Jimmy Haslam knows this is a long season. And he's not going to panic two games in, right? He's not going to start freaking out that this head coach and this GM sold him on signing a $230 million check and trading all those first and second and third, all those picks or whatever for Deshaun Watson after two games. Haslam's a bright guy. And he has panicked before. And I think he wants to learn from his mistakes, right? He wants to stop firing coaches after one season. He wants to stop the quarterback carousel. Two games is way too early for Haslam to really have Stefanski in the hot seat. If we're talking six to eight games in and nothing's improved, that's a different conversation. But right now, it's probably just warm. But I don't even think it's that warm of a seat, meaning I don't think there is any discussion in Berea of, hey, this, uh, this could be Stefanski's last Sunday. That's just not taking place right now. Jared Roush, at which week do you – oh, my. 
kind of funny. At which week do you start panicking if the offense can't make a change? I would say like week, week, week six, right? You get six games into the year. Six games into the year, you sort of know who you are at that point. You've got a pretty good identity. There's going to be flukes. There's going to be late pushes by teams and whatnot. I remember, for example, the Eagles two years ago now. Remember they made the playoffs as the seven seed, lost to the Bucks in the first round of Tampa Bay. They were like two and six to start the year. And then they won their last seven games to go nine and eight, something like that. Those things happen. Could this happen here for the Browns? Sure, maybe. But for now, I'll say six weeks is a good line in the sand of like, hey, you had your bye, you came out of your bye, so you had two weeks to prepare for one game, and then we spotted you an extra game week six in Indianapolis, where you're at now. That would be my line in the sand. Week six, I think that's week six in Indianapolis. All right, we got a mailbag coming up later on in the show, so ask your questions right now. Hashtag Browns, or you can super chat. All the super chats we get get included in our mailbag. So if you want to have your question on screen for all of our viewers to see, super chat, and we will throw it on screen. So with that being said, we now have to talk about something that's impossible. As Stefanski put it himself, replacing Nick Chubb. Trace, are we ready to rock and roll? All right, I'm not ready, but uh, yeah, we got we to figure this out. Here we go. Before we start talking about even the idea of replacing Nick Chubb, let me say right now, there is no replacing Nick Chubb. Kevin Stefanski said that in his presser today over Zoom. There's no replacing that guy in the locker room. There's no replacing that guy in the huddle, on the sideline, in between the tackles. You can make a good effort at trying to find someone who's going to get you similar production. But make no mistake, this is not a Nick Chubb replacement because you're not replacing Nick Chubb. You're replacing your starting running back. And that's not an easy thing to do, but I want to make it perfect, perfectly clear right now. This is uh, an impossible quest to try and replace number 24 for this team. Now, we did get some injury updates and whatnot uh, from Kevin Stefanski's press conference today where he said they're working on options in the running back room with the absence of Nick Chubb. Andrew Barry and the front office are working through that now. So all options are on the table. It's Blockbuster Barry, as I call him. So do not rule out a big free agent sign. Oh, big's a strong word. A free agent signing, a trade, a big trade. But for now, it is going to be an in-house replacement. So let's start our, our search party of a three-pronged search with number one, in-house. Who's going to be this team's RB1 on Sunday? My suspicion is Jerome Ford, because that's what Kevin Stefanski said. He said Jerome Ford is our RB1 now. So next man up mentality. Pierre Strong Jr. is going to move up the depth chart. Hassan Hall is on the practice squad. He's the only running back on the practice squad. Maybe he gets elevated to the active roster on game day if they don't add anyone between now and Sunday. But Jerome Ford, week two, when he filled in for Nick Chubb, he had that incredible 69-yard rush. Here are his stats from week two. 16 carries, 106 yards, 6.6 yards a carry. Jerome Ford did a very good job, I think, filling in for Chubb. He had a big spark play here and there. He put a great effort in, make no mistake. Ford is not ready, though, to be a bell cow back. Like, this running back room cannot proceed forward as it's currently constructed with Jerome Ford, Pierre Strong Jr., and say Hassan Hall gets promoted from the practice squad. No. Kevin Stefanski said to himself, there are going to be changes made. There are going to be additions to this running back room. Andrew Barry and his team are running through all those options. But Ford, he's going to be a good fill-in for the time being, but he's not going to be the long-term guy to get you 20 to 25 carries a game or something like that. That's just not going to happen. However, I am confident that Ford can at least keep the ship afloat for this upcoming week if they need him to have you know, a bell cow game on Sunday against the Titans until they sign someone and get them up to game speed, maybe sign someone to their practice squad, promote them once they're ready, or make a trade. And it takes, you know, more than just a few days to learn the playbook and get up to speed. But for now, Ford is your RB1. I don't think that's going to be the case for the entire season, though. Moving on to the second replacement option, and that is free agency. Now, this is definitely an interesting pool of free agents because it's got names like Kareem Hunt and Leonard Fournette in it. 
The Browns did bring Daryl Henderson in for a visit back in I like May or June at this point, and they didn't sign him, so I don't know if that was a sign of the visit didn't go well or that was them just putting a feeler out in case something happened. They had a good plan, C or D, to sign. But Kareem Hunt and Leonard Fournette, definitely the biggest name of the bunch. And I'll throw their stats from last year on screen. They're not great stats. Both players averaged less than four yards a carry. Leonard Fournette ran behind a awful, I mean, a truly an atrocious offensive line in Tampa Bay that was just completely decimated with injuries. But Kareem Hunt, a career low in rushing and receiving average. Personally, this might not be a popular opinion with everyone in the room. I'd rather have Leonard Fournette. He's a good tackle. He's a good running back in between the tackles. He's good at the goal line. He's a good receiving back, which we know Deshaun Watson likes to get those RPOs going. He likes to get the running backs involved and things like that. I would lean towards Leonard Fournette. I just saw a Kareem Hunt that looked like he lost a step last year. And I think Leonard Fournette is a little bit, you know, on the uh, lighter side of usage in his career. And he can get you some good games uh, moving forward. So if I had to pick a running back, I'd go with Leonard Fournette. Let me know who you'd rather have, though. Kareem Hunt or Leonard Fournette. Just type the initials for the player you'd rather have the Browns sign down below in the comment section. Moving on to the third replacement option. And I hate using the word replacement because it makes my skin crawl. But it is a trade, and there are lots of good running backs out there that Andrew Barry very well may trade for. And we're going to look at those running backs in just a second. But I first have to tell everyone about our sponsor today, which is AG1, because today's Browns report is sponsored by AG1. Now, I have AG1 every day because I get comprehensive and conven convenient daily nutrition at drinkag1.com slash chatsports. I recently gave AG1 a try because I hated taking pills slash vitamins and wanted a supplement that actually tastes great. I take AG1 in the morning, and it makes me feel ready to take on my day. It also really helps me with starting my day on the right foot and getting into a healthier lifestyle. I start the day with making one great choice, AG1, and more healthy decisions then follow. Covering my nutritional basis for the day also couldn't be easier, which is why I trust AG1. I just mix one small scoop of AG1 with water, drink it first thing in the morning, done. I also like that it costs less than $3 a day, which is pretty good if you ask me. It's a really effective daily habit with the highest quality sourced ingredients, so win-win. If a comprehensive solution is what you need from your supplement routine, then AG1 is giving you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash chatsports. That's drinkag1.com slash chatsports. Check it out. The link is in the comments and the description of today's video. Now, let's check out the trade targets. I've got five names, and there are more, but I'm going to limit it to these five for the time being. Jonathan Taylor, Tyler Algier, James Conner, Deontay Foreman, and Cam Akers. All five of these players come with very different backgrounds and, more importantly, very different trade values. So we've got guys who could go for a first-round pick and guys that could go for a seventh-round pick. So I'm really covering all my bases here as players the Browns could target depending on how much money or how much assets they want to spend on replacing Nick Chubb. I think a trade will happen eventually. I think Jerome Ford will be this team's RB1 on Sunday against the Titans. I don't think he's going to be the RB1 for the rest of the season, though. I think Andrew Barry is just too prone to plugging holes. The moment a, like, a leak pops up, how about this? What's that one commercial of just slapping on the tape that covers all the water? Flex Seal? That's Andrew Barry's next job. Just, there's a problem? Flex Seal, baby. Like, no free ads, but, like, we need a new running back? Jonathan Taylor. Like, he is the master of just covering holes, plugging holes. That sounded weird and making sure this team keeps moving along. So how about Jonathan Taylor? This is a big, you know, hot topic name that I've seen tossed out there, so I want to have a quick discussion on Jonathan Taylor. One, he cannot play until week five. He's on the pup list. Even if he is traded, he stays on the pup list. He's out the first four weeks, guaranteed, no matter what. We are talking about the NFL rushing leader of 2021 with 1,800 yards. Nick Chubb was uh, just behind him, although he missed some time that year. Entering the last year of his rookie contract, he is looking to get a new contract where he gets traded to. 
That's a big hiccup for the Browns. I don't see Cleveland breaking the bank for Jonathan Taylor. Now, maybe Jonathan Taylor agrees, hey, I'll come to the Browns, and we might not have much of a say in it, but I know I'm not going to get a long-term deal, but I'm going to run behind a pretty good offensive line. I can put up some really good numbers, and I can cash in in free agency in March. Jonathan Taylor, though, in his career, last year he missed time for the first time really ever in his NFL career due to injury. I know he missed a game in 2020 due to COVID, but like the story was, even in high school, Jonathan Taylor never missed a practice all the way up until last season. So as for durability, I'm pretty comfortable that Jonathan Taylor is going to be ready to go. He said he can pass a physical, or the reports are that he can pass a physical. So not much um, concern on that part from my end. Now, the rumored trade, if you guys recall, like three weeks ago, was that the Colts and the Dolphins were close on an agreement but ultimately, Indianapolis wanted Jalen Waddell, and Miami laughed and hung up the phone on them. The Browns aren't giving up anything close to Jalen Waddell for Jonathan Taylor. But if the Colts come down from their high asking price and they go, you know what, we wanted to shoot for the stars, it didn't happen, so there's no sense in holding out for a Jalen Waddell, Jalen Waddell caliber player. This is the best offer I can come up with that I think the Browns would actually do. It's two third-round picks. I know Indianapolis wants a first, they're not getting a first. So don't say the Browns can't get Jonathan Taylor. They don't have a first-round pick. No one's giving up a first-round pick for Jonathan Taylor. Okay? Shout out Trent Richardson for that. So maybe a second, but two-thirds could be something Indianapolis goes, you know what? Let's get something and just move on from this headache. And if you were Andrew Barry, I really want to know, would you accept this trade right now? Accept or decline? Browns get Jonathan Taylor. Excuse the word Rams there. The Colts get two third-round picks. Chime in for me down below. Very curious to know what you would do if this was a trade offer that came across your desk. For me, it's pretty tempting not to go get Jonathan Taylor and just reload. I mean, on one side, I feel like I'm being a bit soft when I say replacing Nick Chubb with another superstar running back kind of makes me feel like I'm cheating on Nick Chubb. I don't know if that's just me or if anyone else is like, I would feel a little bit dirty. It'd feel a little bit weird going, moving on from Nick Chubb. We've got our new superstar running back, you know, out with the old, in with the new, like Andy dropping his toys in Toy Story. But Jonathan Taylor would definitely help keep this season moving along and help the Browns not miss too much of a beat because there's no replacing Nick Chubb. I'll take Nick Chubb over Jonathan Taylor every single day of the week. But this is as close as you can really get to getting a new star running back in the backfield. Now, some other guys that were on that list I want to talk about. Tyler Algier and James Conner. So this would be a mid-level trade, meaning it's not going to cost you a first or maybe even a second-day draft pick. It would probably cost you some early to mid-day three draft picks. Tyler Algier with the Falcons, over 1,000 yards through 18 games, entering his second year in the NFL. I liked him coming out of BYU. He was Atlanta's rookie rushing record holder last year with over 1,000 yards. And then James Conner, a familiar face, of course, with the Steelers for quite some time. And he's really hit the fountain of youth in Arizona. I mean, through his last uh, 15 games going from 2022 to now, 950 rushing yards, 308 receiving yards, and nine touchdowns. If I had to pick between one of these two guys, I think Tyler Algier could be a really good bang-for-your-buck type of acquisition. Now, I have no idea if the Atlanta Falcons would be interested in moving on from Algier at all. But they've got this guy named B. John Robinson. And I don't know if you've heard of him yet. He's really good. So what if the Browns come in and go, give us your backup running back for a fourth-round pick? Falcons may say no to that. They may go, nope, we like what we're doing too much. We're 2-0. We're not messing with our mojo. But if Atlanta goes, fourth-round pick for a backup running back is just too good of a deal to pass up on the Browns could have a really good replacement option in terms of trying to salvage the rest of this ground game and having an Algier Jerome Ford committee backfield. Sure, it's not anything close to Nick Chubb, of course, but if it's 75% of what Nick Chubb gives you, 60 70%, for a fourth rounder, that might be your best option. Now, another name to keep an eye on is Cam Akers because Jordan Schultz tweeted out, uh, tweeted out today. Sorry, I lost my voice from the watch party. Uh, several teams have checked in with the Rams about a potential Cam Akers trade, including the Buccaneers, Ravens, Raiders, and Browns, among others. It's still possible Akers gets released, salary reasons, but the team is actively shopping him, and he's more than likely played his last game there. Akers had three consecutive 100-plus-yard rushing games 
with three touchdowns to close out last season. If the word on the street is the Rams are going to release Cam Akers, I don't see Andrew Barry trading for a guy that if he knows he just has to wait a little bit longer, he can get on the open market. But Cam Akers so far in his NFL career, 1,400 yards in 30 games, 10 touchdowns. Whoever drafts Cam Akers in fantasy football, one, no one cares about your fantasy team, but two, you're a fool. Because in my opinion, Cam Akers, he sucks. I, I am not in on Cam Akers whatsoever. This is not a move I am rooting for. I'd much rather see the Browns go out and trade for Tyler Algier or James Conner, who I didn't touch on too much, but Arizona is pretty much openly tanking right now. James Conner is entering the last year of his contract. I think Algier or Conner, if either player is available, and if they're not, sure, then this is a pointless conversation. But more or less, every player is available. Like Every player has a price, especially running backs on tanking teams and backup running backs. So I think those two guys are definitely someone you could give a phone call for. I am passing on Cam Akers, though. No way. I don't know what is going on in L.A., but this is the second time in 12 months Cam Akers has been a healthy scratch, inactive, benched. No idea if he's just not a good fit in the locker room, but I don't want to bring that over to Cleveland because it's not like he's a healthy scratch because they have some other superstar running back they want to get the ball to. I don't know what the issue is with Cam Akers, but I don't want to find out. Now, before we get on out of here, if you enjoy today's show, consider subscribing because we are trying to reach 24,000 subs, which is uh, just not great timing, I would say. But we are less than 300 subs away, 219 if my math is correct. So consider subscribing to the channel and get the best Browns content out there. Pick a running back for me, Kareem Hunt or Leonard Fournette. Dude, the 24,000 subs being the next milestone, like could have been an awesome like, do it for Nick Chubb. But it's like, no, I, I'm not going to lobby Nick Chubb for subs. It's just like, damn. It's just not good time. I, I wish we were at 25 subs right now. But uh, nevertheless, let me know. I see a lot of Kareem Hunts in the chat right now. I'm going to go with Leonard Fournette. I, I just didn't like what I saw to Kareem Hunt last year. And I think Leonard Fournette behind a, go behind a good offensive line can be more productive. A $20 super check coming in from Jarrett Rouse. Jarrett, thank you so much for your support of today's show. This is just for a drink or two if you need one. I think we all do. Peace out, Dog Pound. I'll, on to the Titans. Jarrett. I'm taking the day off from drinking today, but I'll have an extra one for you the next time. I've got a beer in my hand. Thank you so much for supporting the show, as always. But you're right. On to the Titans. We're on to Cincinnati, right? There are a lot of more game, a lot of games left on the schedule, and the Browns don't have time to feel sorry for themselves, to dwell, to, you know, cry. I mean, that, that, we, we can cry. The players can't cry. They can cry a little bit, but they got to get ready for Tennessee because that's going to be here on Sunday, and the Titans – they are the biggest trap game, I'm telling you right now, for every single team playing Tennessee this year. Every single fan base looks at the Titans and goes, they suck now. They're not good. They're healthy. They have Derrick Henry. They've got a good defense, and they've got Mike Vrabel. You better believe they're going to come in ready to play hard every single week. The Chargers lost week two to them, and week one in New Orleans was an absolute bar fight. Was it not Chase? Uh, Trace? Very big defensive battle. Like the Titans offense, it's not as good as it used to be. D-Hop definitely is still a great player, but if you can get your CBs and your DBs to lock down D-Hop, you can limit uh, Derrick Henry to less than five yards of carry. I mean, you're going to win that game. They mm -hmm. have a good defense, though, but they, they, they're they a tough team. They're going to play scrappy. Indeed. Okay. Um, we got a mailbag coming up next here. So get your questions in. You can super chat. We guarantee it goes on screen during the mailbag. Or you can use hashtag Browns. Trace the super chats that have questions in them. We'll start the mailbag with those pretty much. Um, and then the ones that are just general super chats. We'll kind of wrap it up with those ones uh, if that works for you. So with that being said, we need some more questions, uh, Mr. Gerard says. So get those questions in the chat right now. Hashtag Browns, ask me anything. Nick Chubb replacements related, uh, Deshaun Watson related, Kevin Stefanski hot seat related, whatever it is, whatever it may be, get those questions in right now, and we will start uh, our, mail by, our, mail, our mailbag in just a moment. I got Joshua Miller getting some questions in the chat right now. Kenny Pickett had negative seven yards in the fourth quarter. 
for the Steelers. No one's crashing on him. Yeah, yeah. Kenny Pickett sucks. Um, okay, we got an interesting uh, question about Emmett Smith from someone who appears to be in Japan. Um, I worry about the Browns against any well-coached team. Rocky Balboa, that is a very good statement. Like, Kevin Stefanski seems to crumble when the lights are on and they're at their absolute brightest. Um, we'll start the mailbag, by the way, with just the first question on screen. Yeah, we'll get right into that. Terry Hall, use hashtag Browns. If you don't put hashtag Browns like Tyler Hoover did, then we can't pull it and put it on screen. So, Terry, just copy and paste, put it back in the chat, but have hashtag Browns at the very end of it like Joshua Durst did. All right, here we go. Um, I think we are – Arthur, what's the latest news on Chubb? Oh, who's going to tell Arthur? I'm not – someone else tell Arthur. Uh, it's not good news, Arthur. Um, all right, here we go. Let's uh, let's get into it. Let's get into um, yeah our uh, our mailbag starting off. Uh, we'll save that one for later. Yeah. No, that's okay. Um, no, we'll save save those two for the end. Save that one for the end. You guys are good to see how the how the sausage is made. Uh, yeah, that's a good one. All right, here we go. End of the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, here we go. Yep. Mailbag time here on the Cleveland Browns report. Our first question is coming in from Chef Rubin. Is Stefanski's seat warm or hot? If it's just these two options, I'll say warm. I mean, Jimmy Haslam knows that the expectations are sky high this year, right? And it, Stefanski knows that. Barry knows that. Everyone knows that. But Jimmy Haslam also knows, and ultimately – the only opinion that matters is Jimmy Haslam's opinion. Jimmy Haslam knows that he is not about to start another head coaching carousel. He has said that he has learned from his mistakes and he has done firing coaches off of quick impulse reactions and whatnot. And being one and one and losing in week two and putting someone on the hot seat after that is an impulse reaction. So no, I don't think Kevin Stefanski is on the hot seat. You might not like him as the head coach, but right now when your team is one and one, you're not in the hot seat. That's just uh, a fact. I don't, I don't know how else to put it. Next one coming in from Jarrett Roush. At which week do you start panicking if the offense can't make a change? Um, for me, I would say week six, right? The Browns have week six, excuse me, against the Indianapolis Colts, week three against the Titans, week four against the Ravens, week five's a bye, week six against the 49ers, sorry, week seven. That's the one I'm going with, week seven against the Colts. That's two games after your bye week. I think if you can come out after the bye and put together a good performance against the 49ers, you're going to feel a lot good about yourself. Uh, if it's two bad games after the bye, yeah, I'm going to start panicking. Right now, I'm not panicking. It's two weeks of an 18-week se uh, season. No, I'm not panicking two weeks. In. I'm just not going to not gonna even like reach for the panic button at the moment. I do know where it is, though. I know which drawer it is in, but I'm not going to take it out of the drawer just yet. I'm going to save that for a few weeks from now. Levi Mayfield. Start DTR for a game. Levi, I appreciate you always being a staple of the show, but no. You're not benching Deshaun Watson. It's just not happening. Dorian Thompson-Robinson had an awesome preseason, but no. Simply put, no. Tyrone, Tyrone, wouldn't mind seeing Aaron Jones. Okay, so there was, a, there was some trade conversations, or rumors, I should say, involving Jonathan Taylor to the Packers, and a lot of people thought, well, either Aaron Jones or A.J. Dillon would be going back to Indianapolis, which means the Packers might be okay with parting wage from one of those two players. Now, the Packers GM back then kind of shut down the idea of this trade rumor, although I think he just got caught and said, we don't see ourselves without Aaron Jones, and A.J. Dillon's a big part of what we want to do, yada, 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 all that good stuff. But Aaron Jones is injured at the moment. He missed week two, but if he's healthy... I just don't think the Packers are interested in moving on from him ultimately. You'd have to give him an offer they can't refuse. And right now, maybe the Browns are in a spot where they have to start giving out offers and start overpaying and over, you know, selling for assets to try and salvage this season. And if that's the case, Aaron Jones is a good option. He's a good receiving back. He's a good running back. But if the Browns are not willing to start parting ways with good draft assets, not having a first-round pick this year, keep in mind, then Aaron Jones might not be in the play. Nick Howard, what's going on? 
How about trading for Eno Benjamin? Also, I agree, bring in Leonard Fournette, uh, playoff Lenny. I should say that we are filming today's live show during our mailbag. Excuse me, we're filming today's mailbag during our live show, which was on Tuesday. So if any moves happen between now and when you're watching this video, just bear with us. But as for Eno Benjamin, it would cost you pretty much nothing, right? Last I saw, he was in the Cardinals. He's in the Saints now. Yeah, he left Arizona. Um, sure, you, you could trade. You could trade for Eno Benjamin for a 2025 seventh round draft pick. Like you could trade him for a bag of footballs. I don't know how much better he is than Jerome Ford or Pierre Strong Jr. So if you're trying to improve the running back room, I don't think Eno Benjamin's the guy to do that. As for Leonard Fournette, he could legitimately improve the running back room. Maxwell, next one up. Thoughts on trading DPJ? Dude hasn't done anything through two weeks. Yeah, DPJ so far has been more or less a bystander. I mean, we are two weeks into the season, and he has one reception for 12 yards. So with him being a free agent at the end of this year, makes you kind of wonder if DPJ is just not going to be a part of this team's long-term plans, and he's not really in their current plans, then what's the point of holding on to him? My pushback will be, it's two weeks. Like, do not give up on players two weeks into the season. That's just way too early. This offense needs to get figured out. This passing game needs to get better. They're going to want Donovan Peoples-Jones to be there to help bring along the passing game. If you want Watson to improve, I don't think a good way to do that is to take away one of his top guys. That's probably not going to help the cause a lot. But if the Browns ultimately feel DPJ is just not going to be a big contributor this year and they want to get something for him now before he leaves in free agency, if they don't plan on re-signing him, then I could see Andrew Barry maybe even including DPJ in for a running back deal to try and soften some of the uh, draft capital you'd have to use to maybe get one of the premium running backs out there. But let me know, would you trade Donovan Peoples-Jones for a fifth-round draft pick? Type Y for yes, type N for no down in the comments section. I would ultimately pass right now if we are at the trade deadline and DPJ still doesn't have much of a role in this offense. Sure, trade him then. But for now, I'm going to hold on to him two weeks in. Tyler Hoover, next one up. How do you feel about Stefanski's play calling? Tyler, not great. Simply put, not great. On one hand, the Browns probably shouldn't have been in a position where they were passing the ball late in the fourth quarter to lead to a strip sack fumble recovery for a touchdown. But on the other hand, when you don't have Nick Chubb in the backfield and you want to keep moving the chains to keep chewing up clock, then you kind of find yourself in between the rock, between a rock and a hard place. Ultimately, I feel like with Stefanski, his play calling when the lights are the brightest, he sucks. Like he's just not a good play caller when it's a big, you know, big balls game. Like when it is a Monday night game when there's a lot of pressure on this team or it is all eyes on Cleveland right now. Stefanski seems to crumble under that kind of pressure. He's awesome at Sunday at one o'clock Eastern. Maybe he's like the maybe he's the Kirk Cousins of head coaches. That, that, that very well could be that. Maybe Kevin Stefanski, who coached Kirk, Kirk, Kirk Cousins, is the Kirk Cousins of head coaches. That might be my new spin here. How do I feel about it? Not good. I don't think there's a better play caller on this team. AVP, Alex Van Pelt, a better play caller. Once you go to the, you know, once you remove the head coach's play calling, there's no going back to it usually. If you do go back to it, things have quickly spiraled out of control. So I'm going to reluctantly agree to hold on to Kevin Stefanski remaining the play caller. Now, before we get on to the rest of the questions in today's mailbag, our show is sponsored by Game Time. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater near you. Now, they have so many awesome features, but one of the best ones is just downloading the Game Time app and getting $20 off your first purchase. Now, I personally use Game Time when I went to a college football game now a few weeks ago, and with Game Time, like I just mentioned, I got $20 off my ticket. So if you are looking to go to a Browns game, a Cavs game coming up soon, a concert, anything going on in Cleveland or wherever you live, check out Game Time. Download the Game Time app. Use promo code BROWNSCHAT. Get $20 off. It's an awesome tool because it gives you so many great features like being able to see what your seats will look like before you buy tickets, which with other sites, it's not that easy. And I saw an image of a seat at a... University of Texas football game where it is the seats right behind like the big uh, 
uterus looking longhorn behind one of the end zones. So with game time, you don't have any of those issues. So download game time today, create an account and use code Browns chat for $20 off. Tickets are, by the way, are sent directly to your phone, so you never have to dig through your email, and then you're the guy at the ticket gate trying to scroll up and down your email to find an old email with your tickets on it. Nope, they're right on your phone. It's super easy. It's super simple. So download Game Time today. Last-minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Terms apply, but once again, create an account and use code BROWNSCHAT for $20 off. Terry Hall, what's going on, dude? What is your updated win-loss for the Browns? I had him at my first win-loss prediction. I hate doing these. Was 10-7, and seven, if I remember correctly, back when the schedule came out in May. My second one before the season was 12-5. and five. I'm probably closer to my 10-7 and seven one than my 12-7, and seven, my 12-5. and five. But also, in my first one, I had the Browns going 1-1 one one to start. So being 1-1 one one does not remove you from winning 12 games. I think... 10 and 7, just the way they played offensively through these first two games, make it a lot more feasible. However, the defense continues to limit the opposing offense to 3 and 12 points. The Browns could more or less just uh, half ass their way to 9, 10 wins, and that's good enough to get in the playoffs, but it's not good enough to take down the juggernauts of the AFC. Roman Empire fan, how often do you think of the Roman Empire? Uh, should the Browns extend Grant Delpit? Grant Delpit is. Freaking awesome. The dude might be this team's best player on defense after Miles Garrett. And I am not opposed to extending Miles Garrett, excuse me, uh, extending Grant Delpit midseason. We saw the Browns do this with Wyatt Teller and Joel Petonio. Nick Chubb got an extension in August of two years ago. So Andrew Barry is not afraid to extend someone mid year and get it done before free agency gets here. And this is something I can definitely get around. Because Grant Delpit is not looking like, hey, that's a good player that you use for four years on a cheap rookie contract, and then you replace. No, Grant Delpit looks like a permanent fixture of this defense long term. I want to see this get done. I want to see Andrew Barry lock down Grant Delpit. I do not want to see him play for any team next year. Get it done, Andrew Barry. Grant Delpit, after Miles Garrett, in my opinion, has been the best player on this Browns defense. I think he's been more valuable to the secondary than maybe even Denzel Ward. I mean, that's just a huge testament to how well 22 has played. And this is not a slight against 21, but Grant Delpit, he's been rock solid, dude. So who do you think the best player is on defense, by the way, after Miles Garrett so far? Two weeks in, who's been second best? Or if you think Grant Delpit's the best, you can roll with that as well. For me, I think it's Grant Delpit. Next question coming in from Tyrone Tyrone. The Titans are in rebuild mode and could be looking to get rid of King Derrick Henry. Wouldn't be a bad addition. Yeah, I agree. Um, I don't think the Titans are interested in trading Derrick Henry, though. That, that is sort of where this conversation comes to an end. I don't think Tennessee is thinking they are in rebuild mode. They are thinking, we're a team that was 7-2 and two last year, and then we lost our or 7-3. and three. And then we lost our last seven games to go 7-10. and 10. They're 1-1 one one right now. I don't think this is a time where they feel like they need to start selling off pieces. Now, if October 31st rolls around and the Titans have two wins to their name and the Browns have figured out their offense, but they know Jerome Ford has limitations, sure, this is a conversation that would make a lot more sense in October. But as it stands right now in September, I don't think the Browns are going to make this big of a tidal wave type of trade and I don't think the Titans are interested in trading the greatest player in franchise history after two weeks when they're one and one themselves. Joshua Miller, next one up. I think a tandem of Jerome Ford and Dearness Johnson would be solid and cheap. Johnson is currently listed as RB3 and could be had for a day three pick. Yes, this is definitely a cheaper and much more economical route where if the Browns feel like we just don't want to use the assets on a short-term running back, meaning... This guy's only going to be here for the rest of the year, and then he's gone. Then Dearness Johnson's one of the man. He's, he's an awesome man for the job. Like if you are looking for running backs that you can get for a seventh round draft pick, Dearness Johnson is probably at the top of my list. I'm still not really sold on Dearness Johnson actually being a very valuable addition to the running back room. Nothing against what he did in 2021, but he's RB three in Jacksonville. Don't you think that might be for a bit of a reason? 
after a rookie came in and took the RB2 job from him. It's kind of food for thought right there. I would pump the brakes on thinking Dearness Johnson's going to come in and look like the guy who ran all over the Broncos defense on Thursday night, all over the Bengals in the last game of the season. Just some uh, hesitation I have on Dearness Johnson. But if you want to get a running back for a seventh-round pick, he's the man for the job. We got some quick super chats I want to run through here coming in from Matthew Kulpa. Uh, us Browns Nation need to come together and show support for Chubb and donate to his charity at First Candle Prayers for 24. Matthew, I really appreciate this super chat and your thoughts and overall your genuine kindness towards Nick Chubb. It's an awesome thing what you're doing here, and I couldn't agree with it more. Go support Nick Chubb and his charitable causes. The guy is awesome. I mean, that's really all that needs to be said. He is a, a, a superhero to so many people in Cleveland. He has been the rock for this organization for almost a half a decade at this point, more than that. So, yeah, Matthew, I back this sentiment up 100%. Go support Nick Chubb. Captain Nog, man, Nick Chubb was the reason I became a Browns fan. He made football fun. Just the drive that man has is magnetizing and made me excited to watch football. I pray for a perfect recovery. Love you, Chubb. Nick Chubb was someone that I think we all sort of thought was, like, untouchable, right? Like, he's uh, immortal, right? He squats 800 pounds. No one can take down Nick Chubb. Unfortunately, we learned that everyone in the NFL is mortal. And Captain Og, I could not agree more that Nick Chubb is not just, you know, the reason you became a Browns fan, but a reason a lot of people became a Browns fan. The reason why I've got this jersey on right now is because I love Nick Chubb, and it sucks that he's not going to be a part of the rest of the season. Jarrett Roush, this has just turned into a complete funeral slash eulogy, and we kind of need to hear it. Still can't wrap my head, I still can't wrap my mind around it. Been wanting to talk to someone all day about it. I love this team and always will, but this is just devastating. Only thing is to keep chugging along and try their damn best. Thank you, Petey. Jarrett, yeah, I, uh, I sign off on this 100%. It is something that I woke up on Monday morning feel, or Tuesday morning thinking, this is a nightmare. And I hope, I hope last night never happened, but it did happen. Joshua Miller. Last one here, Grant Delpit is our team MVP through the first two games. Cut, you're right. Who is it on offense? No one. Like, no one's outdoing Grant Delpit on the offensive side. That's a, that's a fact. On the defensive side, it's easy to say Miles Garrett, but Grant Delpit has been a better player probably. So I, I, would, uh, I would agree, Josh. Grant Delpit is definitely the MVP of the Browns two games in. That's going to do it for us on today's Mailbag. Thank you so much for tuning in. I really appreciate you taking time out of your day to come hang out with us here at the Cleveland Browns Report. If you enjoyed our type of content, consider subscribing and get yourself the best free Browns YouTube content out there. All right, would you trade DPJ for a fifth? Let me know down in the comments section. Everyone's got like a bazillion ideas for running backs. I mean, the Derrick Henry one was something I had not even thought about. See, I, I kind of disagree with the idea that the Titans are and they're blowing it up. They're not like, blowing it they up. They wouldn't have signed DeAndre Hopkins if they were blowing it up. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, that's a great point. I, I don't think the Titans are in a spot where they want to start selling off assets. Not when they're one and one, right? Not when they're one and one. I, yeah, no, Clyde Edwards Alaire sucks. He's, he's worse than Cam Akers, who also sucks. So, no. Hard veto on both of those guys right there. Would you guys trade DPJ for a fifth? Um, no. Mark says no. Cool guy says no. Gregory says no. I'm, I'm in agreement that at this present moment, I'm not interested in trading Donovan Peoples-Jones. I don't think you improve this passing attack by trading away DPJ right now. If the bye week, excuse me, if the trade deadline rolls around and he's like, being outgained by David Bell like he was last night, then we can have a different conversation then. But for now, I'm going to stay put and say, don't start trading away good players to try and improve the offense. I don't see how that helps anyone involved. So, uh, about Trey Sermon, yeah, he's bounced around. I kind of wonder why he hasn't stuck on, right? Didn't really catch on in San Francisco. I think he had a good preseason with the uh, Eagles this year, and then he got released. Trey Sermon's an opera. That's someone you could add to your practice squad if you wanted to, to see if you know if he's in football shape slash if he can really run with the best of the best, and if he can run behind this Browns offensive line. 
and that's a low-level move that won't require much at all. But if you think Trey Sermon's going to come in and save the day, or not even save the day because no one thinks that, but if you think Trey Sermon's going to come in and look like what he did in Columbus, I got bad news for you. That guy's not here. That, that guy's gone. So I, I would kind of give up on that hope. All right. Um, last question I'll ask or read here. Dustin Hopkins missed a kick. Are we looking for a new kicker yet? No. Not after Hopkins made a 50-plus yarder on Monday night. He went two for three. One for two from 43, made one from over 50 yards. You, you don't cut a kicker after just one miss. Maybe two misses, but not one miss. Not one miss. All right, unless we get another super chat, we are going to have to sign off. I know Trace, our producer today, has a lot of other content he needs to help produce and film, so I don't want to hold him up forever, but the rules of chat sports are if you get a super chat, you get to keep the studio. So it's always great hanging out with the Dog Pound. You guys know I love talking with you and – it's a different tone in today's conversation and today's show, but it's hard to be joyful and cheerful and optimistic about the future after losing the heart and soul of your team yesterday. It is an absolute, like, it's, it's a red wedding. We got red wedding yesterday. We got red wedding yesterday. I don't know who the Lannisters were in this analogy. Minka Fitzpatrick, maybe. We got, we, we got fucking red wedding yesterday. That was that sucked. Um, Rob would have been Nick Chubb, right? Rob was Nick Chubb. I don't know his girlfriend or his wife at the time. She was hot. I liked her. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that's gonna do it for us uh, with the Browns and Game of Thrones uh, spoiler right there. So we are going to let you guys go. Enjoy the rest of your Tuesday as much as you can. Ultimately. I know this sounds really stupid, but time heals all. Like, it hurts right now, and I'm acting like this is a breakup, but the season continues, the show goes on, week three is going to get here, and if you want something to hold on to, the worst game outside of the Steelers game that I can really remember was the Jets game. You remember the Browns won the next week after the Jets lost. So this team can bounce back. This team can be resilient. It's a little bit different when you lose to the Jets versus when you lose Nick Chubb. But I, I'm not willing to pack it up and call it a season. Joshua Miller with a $5 super chat. Let's go, Josh. Does Coach Stefanski need to steal the 2019 to 2020 playbook from Houston to unlock Deshaun Watson? I, I remember when, they, when, when Stefanski and the Browns went and met with Watson before they traded for him. And Stefanski had a cut up of all of Watson's plays from Houston and they ran through what he did in Houston and what he would have him do in Cleveland, and it was like football porn to them. Where's that guy? Where's that plan? I don't think you need Watson's playbook from Houston, but you, you had a plan already of what you could improve on, and we're not seeing the improvement. So maybe. I, I don't think you need to really steal much of it. You have Watson. Just ask what the plays were, right? Just ask what worked for him if this is truly a case of they're not leaning into it's, it. They're, it's not a case of them not leaning into Watson's strengths. Believe me, this entire offense has been constructed around what Deshaun Watson does well. Right now, it's a mixture of execution. That is something that you can blame all, all you want on Stefanski. Execution from the offensive line to the wide receivers to the quarterback is not perfect at the moment. And it needs to be in the NFL. It needs to be close to perfect. So execution needs to get better, and the play calling definitely needs to improve. Uh, Nick H. with a $2 Super Chat. Oh, I hate this question. Do you think Chubb played his last game as a Brown? I've got no idea. Um, it's a very severe knee, knee injury, multiple torn knee ligaments. The only, like, I wouldn't say silver lining, but the only, like, upside, if you will, would be he has a long time to recover, right? He has almost as much time as you possibly could have before next season. Whereas if he got hurt in like week 11 or week 12, different conversation. But he got hurt in September. So he could potentially be back next, next September. I'll say this much. Nick Chubb's contract next year, none of the money is guaranteed. So if the Browns don't think he's going to be anywhere close to where he was and they want to save like over $10 million, then that might be something they explore. And that sucks for Nick Chubb and... His agent kind of screwed him, not having any money, no money tied.
tied to being on the roster. Excuse, excuse me. No money being tied to being on the roster. But Nick Chubb, he may very well have played his last game, not just for the Browns, but maybe in the NFL because he suffered two horrific knee injuries to the same left knee eight years ago in college and then last night. All right, those are the Super Chats, so we will sign off. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Nick, I appreciate your question and your Super Chat. Josh, as always, for supporting the show. I'm going to try and be a bit more upbeat tomorrow, but did anyone want to see a fun, happy PD today? Show of hands. I don't think I wanted to see one, and that's me talking. So we're going to try and rally. We're going to try and regroup. We're going to get ourselves together, and we're on to Tennessee, baby.